Welcome to part three of this video in which we use static particle analysis to uh, find the tension in cables and find the uh, force uh, that has to be exerted by a pole to keep this whole system that I've got drawn on the screen up. In parts one and two, we solved for the force uh, that the pole has to exert using uh, geometry. We were drawing triangles to determine angles of, um, or to, de to determine angles so that we could then uh, find x and y components of tensions in the cables. And uh, it worked. We ended up with uh, uh, equations that we could solve. But in some ways, it was a little bit, um, I don't know, I guess messy. The approach we'll do, or we'll show in this part, is using vectors. And so uh, we'll represent uh, tensions in cables as a magnitude times a unit vector. This approach has the disadvantage of being somewhat less intuitive. It's a little harder to look at things and understand where particular components of forces and such came from. It has the advantage of being a little quicker, and uh, we won't actually do it in this video, but it turns out that if you um, are fairly clever, you can do things with the resulting equation that we'll get, which will be a vector equation, and then we'll actually solve it by breaking it into its x and y components. But if you want to be clever, you can take this vector equation and uh, say do the dot product with vectors or that are orthogonal to ones you don't care about and get equations that simplify. You can do a lot of fairly interesting things which unfortunately are a little beyond the scope of this video. But learning how to do this with vectors is an excellent exercise. It uh, helps you understand uh, how vectors work and uh, eventually when you get to three dimensions uh, my experience has been vectors are pretty much your only hope of getting it right. So let's begin. Uh, we will start by doing the analysis of the ring that's holding up the weight as we did the first time through. And so we'll draw a free body diagram of this ring. We'll treat it as a point. So we have the ring. We have a force going off this direction, which we'll call T1, or the magnitude of it will be T1. We'll have a force going off like this. Whoops. Here, let me actually change this. Let's call this T2 and call this one T1 to be consistent with what we did last time through. And then we have the force exerted by the weight. Okay. Now, again, rather than uh, expressing uh, forces or, or finding things in terms of triangles and angles and such, we'll do the following. We'll say that the vector T1 is the magnitude T1, which we don't know and we're, we will solve for, times a unit vector, which I'll call lambda hat 1. This is the unit vector in the direction of T1. Okay, so if we go back to our picture then, we see that this cable that we're talking about here goes over 30 feet and up 20 feet. So we want to find a unit vector uh, in the direction of, uh, let's see, 30 feet i hat, oops, and that should be negative because it's going left, plus 20 feet j hat. That's the direction of the vector, and we get that again from the geometry. Well, uh, we can actually get this unit vector, lambda hat 1, as being equal to this divided by the square root of minus 30 feet squared plus 20 feet squared. Okay, so we just made a mess there, but hopefully you can see what I'm doing. And so I can work this out um, rather than actually work it out in gory detail. I'm going to do 
sort of cheat and have Wolfram Alpha do it for me. So I have minus 30 and 20, and I just type that in curly braces. And one of the things that it, it finds the vector length, so if you want to know the square root of minus 30 squared plus 20 squared, that's what it is. And it also gives me a normalized vector. And if I put this in approximate form, I see that my normalized vector is minus uh, 0.832 um, i plus 0.555, rounding to three digits, j. So if I go back, oops, if I go back to my picture, I can write this then as minus 0.832 i hat plus 0.555 5 j hat. Okay, and so um, I now have an expression for t1. Again, I don't know the magnitude of t1, but I will um, solve for that momentarily. Okay, similarly, t2, uh, here we'll do t2 in a different color. This yellow is getting boring. Okay, so similarly, t2 is its magnitude times a unit vector in the direction of t2. And so lambda hat 2, uh, let's see, uh, this goes over 20 feet and up 20 feet. So it's going to be 20 feet i plus 20 feet j over the square root of 20 squared plus 20 squared. I've got feet in there too. And this turns out to be 0 0.707 i hat plus 0 0.707 j hat. Okay. And finally, uh, let's put the weight in. The weight we can just look at by inspection. It's um, the 8,000 pounds it's going down, so that's negative, and since it's going down, it's in the vertical direction, which means there's a j hat. So we're actually close to being done here. If we want to do the sum of the forces, and now we're looking at vectors is equal to zero, we can say then that t1 plus t2 plus the weight is equal to zero. Okay, T1 is going to be, uh, let's see, the magnitude times the unit vector. So T1 is going to be T1 times minus 0.832 i hat plus 0.555 j hat plus t2, whoops, let's do this in the proper color, t2 times 0 0.707 i hat, that's a 7 there, I don't know if it didn't, if I drew it in correctly or it didn't work when I drew it, okay, plus 0 0.707 j hat, w will be minus 8,000 pounds j hat, and this is equal to zero. Okay, so now to solve this, um, the straightforward way to do it is take the y components, that is anything that multiplies an i hat, and add them together, set them equal to zero, and uh, then take the j hat components, add them together, and set them equal to zero. And at this point, it looks a lot like what we did in parts one and two. And in fact, if you look at these numbers, that are in the unit vectors, you'll recognize them as cosines and sines of angles that we had in parts one and two. So there's a strong connection between what we're doing here and what we did there. But um, this, depending on how you do the computation of finding uh, lambda hat one, in my mind at least, it's less complex and less prone to error than uh, messing with all of the um, 
messing with all of the angles and sines and cosines and stuff. But again, your mileage may vary. So when I do this, when I actually uh, take the uh, x component, I have t1 times minus 0.832, that's this guy here, plus t2 times 0 0.707, that's this guy here, and this is equal to 0. Uh, the y component, we have t1 times 0.555 plus t2 times 0 0.707 minus 8,000 is equal to 0. And I can take these two equations now and I can plug them into Wolfram well, Alpha or I can go through and solve them by hand. And when I do, I get the values for t1 and t2. Um, since we already essentially did this part in parts 1 and 2. I'm not going to redo it here. Uh, you get then that uh, the solution is T1 is 5,769 pounds and T2 is 6,787 pounds. Okay. So, um, we have now the solution for T1 and T2. If we go back to our original picture, we now need to do a free body diagram up here at the top of this pole. And so I'll do this really quickly and probably won't get around to solving it because I'm running out of time and I'm not sure it's, it warrants that. But we have the point. We have this vector which is the tension due to cable 1. We have the vector pointing up, which is the, the uh, force that the pole applies. And then we have this vector, which is the vector due to cable 3. So this I'm going to call T1x because it's almost the same as T1, but not quite. And I'll call this guy T3. OK, now if we go back to our original picture, the force that the cable exerts in this direction on the top of the pole is the same magnitude but opposite in direction as the force that the cable exerts on the ring that's holding up the weight. So what we can say then is that T1x, the vector, is the same magnitude, T1, times the negative of our unit vector. And that's because it's going in the same direction. Well, it's, it's working along the same line. It's just the opposite direction. And since we know what T1 and our unit vectors are, we can actually just write this all out. I won't do it again because I'm running out of time. T3 will be the magnitude T3, which we don't know and we have to solve for times the unit vector lambda hat 3 and lambda hat 3 this is going to be minus 50 feet minus 100 feet over the square root of 50 squared that's negative and there's feet there plus negative 100 feet squared okay so this is a pretty easy vector to find. And n, we know the vector is going to be the magnitude times j hat. OK, so we know that t1x, the vector, plus t3, the vector, plus n is equal to 0. Now we could take this and break it up into the x and y components, uh, get an equation for the x component, get an equation for the y component, solve those. Uh, again, that'll, that'll give you the same answer as we got in parts 1 and 2. We could also, if we were extremely clever, it turns out that if we don't want to know what t3 is and we're only interested in finding n, 
what we could do is find a vector that's orthogonal. Here, I'll do this in a different color because this is going to get a little weird. And if this seems a little weird, don't worry about it. I can get a vector that's orthogonal to T3. Um, I don't know. I'll call this vector x for now. And I can take vector x and dot this whole equation by it. And by the time I'm done, well, what will happen is because x and t3 are orthogonal, any term here disappears. And so I'll end up with something that depends on t1, which I know, and n, the magnitude, which I don't know, but I'm solving for. And this will allow me then to solve for that n. OK, so this sequence of videos has gone long enough. I hope it's been useful. And uh, if there could be a part four that shows how to actually solve painful bit by painful bit the system of equations that we got on our first free body diagram. Uh, if I have the endurance tonight, I'll do it.